For those of you who are experts on this topic, this is probably a good time to check your email because this will be pretty introductory, but I hope that this will help bridge um, those of you who have just general background in whatever machine learning and, and interest in that topic too. So I, I guess I'm going to kind of cover from the beginning up until a couple years ago, and then I guarantee the speakers the rest of the day will be covering the state-of-the-art stuff. So hopefully this will help get you there. I'd like to acknowledge my PhD student, Jason Hu, postdoc Xiao Jian Xu, and collaborator Mike McCann, who have influenced my thinking on this topic. So I'm going to start out with a high-level tutorial, talk about um, generative models in general, and then specifically score matching diffusion models. Focusing on medical imaging applications, even though I know this is a science and engineering theme day. And then if there's time, I'll talk about some work from our group on patch-based score modeling. We'll see how the time goes for that. So as Ching's already alluded to, generative models are really hot. You don't even have to come to a symposium like this to know that. You can pick up the New York Times and, and read it, and you'll see articles like one that came out uh, within the last year of a... Uh, a movie director talking about an exciting, some exciting stills from a movie he would like to see that actually never existed, a hypothetical version of Tron as created by this particular uh, Chilean uh, movie director, right? And he said that if he actually saw a movie like this, he would be nominating the costume designer for an Academy Award for the incredible costumes that were put in this hypothetical computer-generated scenes. Um, earlier in the New York Times, there were articles about generating faces with various attributes that can be controlled in the generation process, uh, or generating even proteins by using the kind of generative models that are going to be discussed today. Um, so that's sort of in broad sense of hot, how hot generative models are. In my own field, which is in imaging and inverse problems, this is super hot. In fact, well, one of our speakers today, Zhang Chulie, just participated in writing a survey paper that came out in January that summarizes generative models, the broad categories of them, including generative adversarial networks, or GAN models, variational encoder models, normalizing flows. But the, the focus of this symposium and kind of the hottest stuff recently is diffusion models, which you're going to hear about today. And these have really flourished in the last few years, very, very recently. And um, in fact, we have, you know, in the room here, Liu Shen and, and John Tamir and Zhang Chulie, you know, some of the people that came out with the earliest papers uh, on these topics that have really taken over my field by storm here. In fact, there's a group that has been making a GitHub catalog of lots of papers on this topic, and there's already 17 survey papers on generative models, uh, and I'm sure my lists are already out of date because every day there's new papers on archive about this topic. So before I get into a little bit more of the, the fundamentals, let me just give you yet another illustration in the medical imaging setting of, of um, what kinds of things one can do with generative models. And this is work from Yong Song and Li Yue Shen, who just joined Michigan uh, this month from iClear 2022. So in, in X-ray CT imaging, we don't directly image the patient. We collect something called a sinogram, projections at different angles. And traditionally, you take a lot of projections at a lot of angles, and then you take that data and you put it through a fancy reconstruction algorithm to actually form this non-invasive cross-sectional image of the patient. If you want to reduce the time or the dose of that scan, instead of collecting lots of angles, you can collect a smaller set of angles. But now you have much less data. And if you do a straightforward textbook reconstruction of that reduced set of data, you'll get a lousy image. But if you can combine that data with some sort of prior information about what patients look like, then you have the opportunity to make actually surprisingly impressive image. In fact, this is a, I've seen a lot of CT reconstructions with different algorithms. And the one from this paper is quite impressive, both in terms of the numerical values and in terms of the fine details that are recovered that are missing in a lot of the other previous sort of end-to-end -end kind of deep learning methods and methods even before those in reconstructing from such limited data. So the idea here is we have limited data. We need to make up for the missing data with some sort of prior, and that will be a theme of my talk as well as, I'm sure, all the talks that follow. All right, so I'm going to attempt to give definitions of most of the words that are in the title of the symposium. So let's start with what are generative models. So a generative model is typically a model for some probability distribution and a method for drawing samples from that distribution. So the generation here, for those of you who are familiar with this, is like random number generators. And so what will be generated when we're drawing samples? Well, at the lowest level, numbers. But of course, in the digital era, we use numbers to represent lots of things, text, images, videos, molecules, even robotic plans, and so on. So all, these are all applications that people have used generative models for. Um, and of course, 
everything that's generated could be described as fake. And I think if you submit a paper to NeurIPS these days, the main machine learning conference, you have to address the societal impact and potential harmful consequences. And I think we should just pause for 30 seconds in this symposium and realize what we're talking about today, I think, can have a transformative effect on both science and engineering and potentially on society. We're talking about generating fake stuff from training data. And that needs to be acknowledged. And I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's amazing what it can do, and it's also a little bit scary about what it might do to democracy. All right, so usually the models that we're fitting depend on many parameters. So we typically work with parametric models, and the challenges then are how do you learn those parameters from training data in a way that hopefully the model that you've learned is representative of the broad population of interest, which means you need a sufficient diversity in that training data. So that's one challenge. And the other challenge is, how do you efficiently draw samples from that parametric model that you've learned? And I think you'll see those themes occurring repeatedly over the course of the day. So I'm going to try to boil this down to a really simple example, a lot of one-dimensional examples, just to give insight with pictures here. So this is a bunch of data that hypothetically might have come from some some training data of interest in an application. So if think of this, for example, as the upper left pixel value in a set of face images. All right, And let's say you, know, you want to generate more face images, so you need to sample from this distribution. So how could you do that? So one way would just be to pick samples at random from your training data. That's a non-parametric approach. There'd be no bias to your model. You're kind of memorizing your training data, so you would not hallucinate. If you just drew samples at random from your training data, you would never generate a negative 2 or a 2 or 22, 22. so there would be none, no sort of, nothing artificial that comes out, nothing fake, actually. You would just be regurgitating your training data. So there'd be no generalization, right? And we're interested in these generative models for generalization, not just regurgitating our training data. And also, in 1D, that might not be a terrible idea, but as soon as you go to higher dimensions, your training data is sparsely located in a gigantic space. I'm showing 1D examples. All the speakers that follow me will be showing examples where I'm sure the images are at least 100 by 100, so 10,000 dimensions. And if, even if you have 5,000 training examples spread across 10,000 dimensions, that's very sparsely located. So you're really missing uh, the ability to sort of thoroughly generate samples from that space if you just sample from your training data. But I'm starting at the very basics here with that concept. So typically what we do is fit a parametric model. So for example, I might imagine that this data came from a gamma distribution. So I would fit the parameters, there's two parameters of the gamma distribution to this data. And then I could draw samples from the gamma distribution. So the fitting process is already, even this one dimensional example, non-trivial. It turns out there's no closed form solution for those two parameters in this example. So you need an iterative algorithm to learn those parameters. And all throughout the day, the speakers will be talking about iterative algorithms for learning the, the models for the, the distributions that they're learning. And then even after you fit this gamma distribution, it turns out that drawing samples from it is not trivial. It takes something called an acceptance rejection method. Um, but it's not that hard compared to the multidimensional draws that you're going to hear about throughout the course of the day. Now, if you fit this model, this di distribution, because a gamma is a non-negative distribution, you'll never generate a negative 2, but you could generate a 2 with some pro probability, or a 22, and then you have to decide, are those hallucinations or are those legitimate generations, right? And I don't have the answer to that, but that's something that we face every time we fit a model to data, that that model could generate samples beyond what the distribution sort of originally told us, and, and casually we call those hallucinations, and how bad that is depends on really how unlikely you think it is compared to the information in your original training samples. So why do we want generative models? So if you're in the creative business, you want to perhaps have a computer assist you in content creation, making graphics like we've seen a few examples of, making music, poetry, college essays. Um, and typically, as even the examples that Xing showed you in his opening slides, typically those are taking samples from a conditional distribution, right? Make a picture of teddy bears eating pizza or whatever, right? Or make a jazz melody in the style of Miles Davis or whatever, right? So we have some conditions, and then we want to draw samples from that conditional distribution or to have a little more technical examples. To maybe you want to design a composite material with certain material properties. So the material properties would be the, the condition, and then you want whatever is the design space of composite materials. You want to sample from that distribution. Now, in the language setting, uh, we have tools already that do this kind of conditional uh, sampling. 
Uh, in fact, ChatGPT is a large language model that can do it, so I asked ChatGPT to write a short joke about AI, and it came up with these three. Why did the AI cross the road, blah, blah, blah. I thought these were pretty bad jokes, and so they are bad enough that I wasn't 100% sure. I thought I should double check, so I asked ChatGPT, is ChatGPT based on a generative model? And it assured me that yes, it is. That doesn't necessarily mean it is, because it's, it's full of a lot of wrong information, but I believe that this one is correct. It's specifically built on the generative pre-trained transform architecture, which is a type of deep neural network for generating natural language tasks. So it's generate. So you notice that I asked this to write a short joke three times, and it gave three different examples, right? Because there's randomness in the generation process, and you're going to see that throughout the day. Now, those most of you here probably realize that UM recently announced its own version of GPT. So I asked it for a short AI joke, and it came up with why is the computer cold and it left its windows open. I said, well, that, that's a little bit better than ChatGPT's joke, maybe. So then I did a Google search of that joke. And it appeared in a 2016 website from Dribbble. So it's basically, in a conditional way, giving us back one of the samples, right? One of the training examples. So I assume that's one of its training examples, right? So it didn't really generate. It did have to interpret my query, but then it was just regurgitating a training example. So just things to be aware of when you're thinking about generative models. I'm not going to talk about language models the rest of the talk. So that's on the sort of content creation side. But here I'm in more of a science and engineering setting. My interest in generative models, and I think what you'll hear, especially throughout the day, is we want these models for performing Bayesian inference. So let me give you a, the, the setting of that in my known a, a medical imaging setting, which I already alluded to. Like if you have this sinogram data, a small amount of sinogram data that's related to the latent variable, which is the the image of the patient in the CT scanner. We know how the CT scanner was built, so we know the likelihood. We know the relation. If we knew what the patient was, we could predict what the data would look like, but it's the other direction we want to go. We have the data, and we want to work backwards to figure out what the image looked like. So we want to in estimate that latent parameters from the given data. And uh, one way to try to do that would be by maximum likelihood estimation. Find the set of latent parameters that maximize the likelihood of the data that's observed but in underdetermined problems, that doesn't work. And, and in the low-dose CT example that I showed you at the beginning, it's an underdetermined problem. There's more pixels in the unknown image than there are in the reduced sinogram. And so the maximum likelihood problem would be is There's multiple solutions to it, and which one are we going to pick? And you're going to hear a lot today, I bet, about accelerated MRI scans, and those are also undetermined problems. So the way to address this, one way to address this, is by using Bayesian methods, where you write down the posterior using Bayes' rule. So then you want to find the latent image that's the most likely in a posterior sense given the data. And that, once you write it down with Bayes' rule, depends on the likelihood, which you, we know because we designed the imaging system. But we need a model, we need a prior for what CT images of patients look like in order to apply Bayesian methods. Um, and that prior you can call a generative model. But the generation part is really not our main interest. It's quantifying which images are more likely and less likely based on training data or other models from, from you know, what patients should look like. And once you have that posterior distribution, you can do lots of things. You could do map estimation, find the most likely like I described, or you could compute, approximately at least, the conditional mean estimator, which is the minimum mean squared error estimator, the, the expectation of the latent parameters given the data. Or you could sample from that posterior distribution in order to try to quantify uncertainty in your inference process. And I'm going to show you several examples of that. And every one of these applications would seem to require the prior, because that's what appears in Bayes' rule. But actually, they don't all really require the prior. All they really need to do all of these things or at least some of them, uh, is the gradient of the prior with respect to the latent parameters. And that's called the score function. You're going to hear that term many times today. And I should, be, since we're pretty close to the statistics department here, I should caution you that in the statistics literature, the score function is the gradient with respect to the unknown parameters of the distribution, whereas in the machine learning community, the score function is the gradient with respect to the latent parameters, the ones that you're trying to uh, make inference about. So be aware of that difference in terminology. I'm pretty sure throughout the rest of the day when we talk, people talk about score functions, they're talking about this gradient right here. So if you have the gradient of the log prior, then you can perform something called Langevin dynamics, which is a stochastic gradient descent uh, 
uh, iteration that looks like this. You start out with typically just a normal distribution for your vector, and then you recursively um, add some perturbation to that with Gaussian noise and some step in the direction of the gradient of the log prior, in other words, the score function. And it turns out that it's been shown that this will draw samples from your prior distribution. Um, even if you don't have really the prior itself, all you have is the gradient of the log of the prior. And to try to give a little bit more intuition about this formula, let's suppose you set the alpha equal to zero. So then your sequence of uh, th this iteration would be taking whatever you started with and adding Gaussian noise to it over and over. That is basically a random walk. And in the continuous limit, that's basically Brownian motion, which is related to diffusion. So I believe, other experts can correct me if I'm wrong, that's sort of where the diffusion and diffusion models come from, that sort of Brownian motion or random walk that's taking place here. On the other hand, if you set beta equal to zero and you only consider this term, you would be doing gradient descent of the log likelihood and you would converge probably to a, to a local maximum of your log prior, of your prior. All right, but it's neither of those extremes that we're interested in. We want some balance between the effect of the score function and this perturbation. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. So here's a synthetic one-dimensional example where I've taken the score function for a Gaussian, mark, uh, Gaussian mixture model uh, and then performed, in this case, 50 trials of this. So start with 50 different random numbers and then run this iterative process where we're adding random noise but also accounting for the score function using a decaying geometric series for the coefficients here. And then because they all start at different points and it's different noise that's be at, being added in the process, you get 50 different traces. And because it's a decaying ge geometric series, eventually these uh, iterations converge. And you can see they start with a very wide distribution and then eventually they converge to some limits. All right, so that's sort of diffusion in 1D illustrated. Now I can take this, instead of 50, I'm going to do 5,000. I think it's 5,000, yes at different points in time and show you histograms of what the distribution looks like. So at the first point in time, at time t equals to 1, I'm drawing samples from a Gaussian distribution, so I have a bell curve. It doesn't look anything like the Gaussian mixture model that I'm really trying to generate. But then if I go on to the next point in time and make a histogram there, already it's starting to look a little bit more like a Gaussian mixture model. Time 3, time 4, time 10, time 100 times 600. So by the time I've done 600 iterations of that, I'm generating samples that look a lot like the Gaussian mixture model whose gradient to log, whose score function I actually plugged into the formula. All right, so you're going to see probably some more pictures like this over the course of the day, but they'll probably be multi-dimensional pictures instead of one-dimensional pictures. But that's what we're doing. We're running this stochastic differential equation or the discrete version of it or you'll hear other variations of that, I think more advanced versions over the course of the day, to draw samples from a distribution described by its score function. Now, that was just to draw samples from the prior. I already said we're more, I'm more interested in drawing samples from the posterior, and that is relatively simple, mm, with some caveats, modification where we need both the score function and the gradient to the log likelihood, and at least in my applications, we know the gradient to the log likelihood because it's a human design system. And if you run this multiple, multiple times, you end up with samples uh, from the posterior um, that you can use then to quantify uncertainty. So in both of these examples, clearly what we need is a score function. And if you have a model already, you can just take compute or write down on paper, whatever, the gradient to log of it. But typically, all you have is training data. And the question is, how can you generate, how can you learn a score function from training data? Now, before I describe that, let me contrast learning score functions from learning more f a full distribution model. So a lot of distributions that are used in Bayesian inference have the form of e to some negative function that we call an energy function divided by this thing called the partition constant, z of theta, that depends on the parameters of the distribution. And if you want to learn this kind of model from training data, you could try to do that by maximum likelihood estimation. So find the parameters of your prior model that make the data, the training data you have the most likely. And if your training data is IID, that involves maximizing the sum of the logs of this model here, which involves maximizing the sum of some terms. And unfortunately, in that expression is this partition function that is usually intractable for interesting models. So this has been a historically a big challenge in sort of learning Bayesian models from training data. 
So I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Suppose instead you decide you want to work with the score function instead of working directly with this kind of distribution. Once you take the, if you write down the log of this kind of very general family of prior models, once you take the log of it and then take the gradient, thankfully the partition function doesn't depend on x, which is what we're taking the gradient with respect to. It only depends on the term up in the exponent. And that makes it easier to deal with. So I think this is part of the reason score models are so popular is because you don't have to think about the partition com um, constant or function. It does have the disadvantage, well, okay, let me come back to that. Let me take the simplest possible example, a one-dimensional Gaussian with mean eight and standard deviation three. If you write down, okay, there's the form of the PDF of one-dimensional Gaussian. If you write down what the derivative of the log of that is, elementary calculus, you find that the equation is just a line. That's the simplest possible score function there is. It's a linear function. And you will notice that the score function goes through zero at the peak of this distribution. And everywhere to the left of zero, the score function is positive. It's, it's, we're going to think of, the, well, it's a gradient, right? So it's a slope. It's pushing you uphill. It's pushing you towards larger values of your prior distribution. And to the right, the uh, score function is negative, which means it's pushing you to the left, which again is pushing you uphill towards the peak of this distribution. So that's a way of thinking about score functions. They're re well, obviously related to the gradient of the prior distribution. Here's a little more complicated example, a gamma distribution. And here I'm just showing you a plot. The gamma distribution has a score function looks like this. Again, it happens to go through zero at the peak here. Uh, and then just for comparison, there's a normal score function. So at least over some range, the gamma score function is approximately linear, but you know, outside of the sort of central peak, it becomes different than linear. And again, the same sign consideration holds. A little bit more complicated distribution, a Gaussian mixture model, a mixture of two Gaussians here. Now the score function goes through zero at a couple locations, at this peak and at this peak. And again, you know, if you're sort of in this range right here, the score function is negative you, pushing you up towards this peak. If you're in this range right here, the score function is positive, which will push you to, push you to the right towards this peak. So always the score function is sort of encouraging you to head towards a nearby mode, perhaps, if I could say very casually. Now here's a, if I were teaching, I like to teach in an interactive way, so why not? We're in an educational setting. Can you recover the PDF from its score function in a 1D case? Any volunteers? Jag is nodding his head yes, so I won't put him on the spot. So the answer is yes. I mean, in general, if you want to recover a function from its derivative, there's a constant you have to think about, right? Uh, Antiderivatives. But we know that PDFs integrate to 1, so you get the constant from that. So the answer is yes. At least in 1D, you could recover the PDF from the score function if you needed it. But for drawing samples, you don't need it. All you need is the score function. You don't need the original PDF. Okay, let's move from 1D to 2D by talking about an example that comes up all the time in image processing, something called total variation that looks at differences between neighboring pixels. And if you put that in a Bayesian setting, it's a prior that's proportional, improper prior, that's proportional to e to the negative, some constant times, uh, the absolute value of the difference between two pixels. All right, so if you just plot that as a PDF, it looks like this. So along the line of identity here, this is, so think of this as two neighboring pixels in an image, and this is some model for their joint distribution. And so in images, neighboring pixels tend to have similar values, unless it happens to be near an edge, but in sort of a uniform region. And so that's why this PDF is bright, has the highest values along along the line of identity, because that's where the two pixels are identical. And then away from that, you get lower values prior probability, because it's less likely that neighboring pixels will have very different values. So OK, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that the score function is a function that takes in as input the number of parameters you're trying to model. So in this case, it'd be two. And the number of outputs is also that same number as inputs, right? The number of inputs and outputs are the same. So I have a two-dimensional distribution here. So the score function is a two-vector at every point in space. And here's actually what it is in this particular example. So if I want to make a picture of the score function, I need to show you both components. So here's the, component, the first component of the score function and the second component of the score function, which maybe is not that intuitive to just look at. But if I take those two components together and treat them as a vector, then I can make a quiver plot. 
And that's what all these red arrows in this plot are. They're showing the two components of the score function as a vector, and you notice all the vectors point uphill, right? They point to the more likely values. So if you think of kind of a diffusion process, if you start down here, the score function is gonna push you towards um, more likely values according to this prior, which are values where the pixels have this are similar. And 2D is, is basically as high as I can illustrate that. And you've got to extend in your mind that to n dimensions where n is huge. All right, so now let's get back to, hopefully that gives you a little intuition about what score functions look like. Let's get back to actually the process of learning a score function, right? So we have some training data that we believe come from some distribution, and we would like to learn, but we don't know the distribution. All right, and we'd like to learn a score function so that we can do all these amazing things with it. So I'm gonna first show you a sort of straw man approach that I can almost guarantee you nobody else will talk about the rest of the day. So one option is to apply, if you're a statistician, this might be the first option you think of, is to apply non-parametric non density estimation methods, such as the kernel density estimation approach, where you take each of your training examples and put a little typically Gaussian on it and add those all up. Now you have a mixture of Gaussians. And you say, okay, that's, that could be my model for what I think the distribution of the data is. And then I'll just apply the definition of the score function to that model. So I take the gradient to the log of that. And once you do a little bit of calculus, the gradient of the log is this expression here, which looks not that messy, right? It's a ratio of sum of number of terms. This approach has a training time that is essentially order one. It's however long it took me to write down that expression and code it up. But at test time, I need to evaluate this score function for lots of different values of x as I'm running that diffusion process. And every time I want to plug in a value of x, I have to compute this sum, this ratio of sums, over every training example. So at test time, I, had a over t I would have order t, where t is the size of my training set, uh, uh, work to do. Plus, it's known that non-parametric density estimation methods get harder and harder as the dimension increase. So in 1D, I can do this. In higher dimensions, it's going to work less and less well. So we need, but this is a non-parametric approach. It would avoid the only tuning parameter here is the width of the Gaussian. You can kind of your guess of how smooth the distribution is. There's no other sort of implicit model bias or whatever built into this non-parametric approach. Here's just an example of that. I've got uh, 200 training samples from this Gaussian mixture distribution shown here, and if I apply the kernel density estimate with a bandwidth of, width of 0 0.9, you get the green curve shown here, which you know roughly approximates the original distribution from which these samples arrived. And then if I take the gradient or the derivative of the log of that green curve, I get this green curve shown here, that, whereas the true score function is the magenta one. So even in 1D, you could say this is not working. I mean, it's somewhat working, but it's not working all that well. So let me move on to something closer to the techniques you'll hear about the rest of the day, which are a little bit more complicated. So again, we have training data, and we want to learn a score function from that training data that we hope represents the gradient of the distribution, of the log of the distribution. So the first approach that I know, at least, that came out almost 20 years ago now, right, I'm giving you the historical up to a couple years ago, it's what's called explicit score matching, where you imagine first doing this kernel density estimate, but you don't just plug that into the definition of the score. Instead, you say, let me find a score function parameterized by some parameters, typically neural network weights, uh, that when I take the squared Euclidean norm of the difference between that model and the gradient of this kernel density estimate, averaged over all my training data, is as close as possible. So this puts more work at the training time because you have to do this optimization problem. I just described it as best fitting, right? That's a minimization problem, an optimization problem. But once I've done all that work at training time, now I have a score function typically represented by a neural network that at test time, all I have to do is put images of X or data X through my score function, which typically feed forward network very fast to evaluate on a GPU. So I've shifted all the work, the most of the work from, from test time to training time here. Uh, this is a little unsatisfactory. You still have to choose a bandwidth here. And so in this original paper by this author, he showed mathematically that this is equivalent to something called implicit score matching, where you go through a derivation that's very similar to the derivation of Stein's unbiased risk estimate, for the few of you who are familiar with that, uh, that involves minimizing a cost function that doesn't depend on this kernel density estimate, but only depends on your data and the, the partial derivatives of your score model 
and the square of the, the score model. And then you just average that over your training data. So that is more practical to uh, have a cost function implement and saves you the trouble that the, this, this sigma here, you don't have to think about this here. It's kind of remarkable um, insight that I think, but kind of didn't go anywhere until more recently. Um, and as always mentioned, so this is a lot of work at training time because you're averaging over all the training data, but the work at test time, that depends on how complicated your model is. It's typically just a feed for a neural network, which you still have to evaluate many times in the diffusion process, but I bet you'll hear speakers talk about how to reduce the number of samples you need, uh, how to make that uh, dynamics faster. Now, this is still not the modern approach that's used, so something called denoising score matching is getting closer to the last couple of years ago. So in 2011, a guy named Vincent showed a remarkable equivalence between the explicit score matching, this function, uh, excuse me, the original explicit score matching here, and something called denoising score matching. And uh, the denoising score matching involves taking your training data, adding noise to it, and then asking the set of parameters your model to be close to you, trying to learn a model where that perturbed version of the data when put through your score function is similar to the noise that you actually perturbed the data with. Um, and so this is like a denoising operation. We've got hopefully good quality training data. We're adding noise to it to make it worse. Remember the score function points uphill. It points towards uh, higher values of the prior probability. And so higher probability you would hope would be less noisy data and according to the amount of noise you added. So this is written as expectation. In practice, you, you actually generate noise from a random number generator. You add it to your training examples. And then you try to find parameters of your model distribution such that, it's, that the output of the score function is like a denoised version of the data that you have, the training data. So that's the denoising score matching approach that has probably been superseded very recently, but it's, it's still being used. Um, and, okay, I've already alluded to, so this, so there's a lot of math on this slide, but I, just the intuition is you take your data and you add noise to it, different amounts of noise, and then you try to get your score model to learn how to reduce that noise. Even if your final application has nothing to do with denoising, even if you're generating molecules or materials or whatever, this might still be how you tackle the learning of the score function approach. Now, there's an obvious question here, how much noise should I add, right? And the answer seems to be add many different noise levels. If you just add one noise level, it turns out this optimization can easily get stuck in local minimizers, and it seems to behave better if you use many noise levels. And this it leads to a family of methods called noise conditional score matching, where you have a distribution of noises that, levels that you consider, and you do this process and you need a network then that has the noise levels and input, so this is called a noise conditional net score network. Uh, sometimes they're as simple as taking an unconditional network and dividing it by the noise level. That's one recommendation in the literature. Uh, and so you're typically, th there's a loss function here for each noise level and you're doing a weighted combination of all those different log, uh, loss functions. It turns out weighting by the different noise variances is the right way to use there in terms of unit analysis and per empirical performance. All right, and, and I'll give you a, con a little bit of an example of that. So I have training, 100 training examples here. If I add just, so that'd be 100 points along this x-axis. If I add just a little bit of noise, I get a Gaussian mixture model that is a bunch of very thin Gaussians. As I add more and more noise, I'm getting mixture models where those o Gaussians overlap more and more. And if I eventually add enough noise, large variance that's sort of large, large standard deviation, large relative to sort of the, the spread of my data, I eventually was to get something that looks kind of like a bell curve. And this is a one-dimensional picture of something that Ching already showed you. I, by coincidence, happened to have the exact same slide here, paper co-authored by our new faculty, Liu Shen and her collaborator, Yang Song, from a couple years ago where you start with training data that looks like this and you add more and more noise to it until you get to the point that eventually you have images that are completely noise where there's no apparent structure in that image, kind of like from, from this you'd have a hard time trying to determine where, you know, what the distribution of the original 100 samples look like. But amazingly, through stochastic differential equation math that I'm not an expert on, you can reverse that process if you know the score function and, and recover and generate samples from the same distribution of your training data. And you're going to hear a lot more about that over the course of the day. 
All right, so there's some trade-offs here. So unlike in GAN models, you don't need adversarial training. GAN models are notoriously difficult to train because of the adversarial aspects. So this is a little bit easier to train. Uh, and you can generate rem remarkable image quality or data quality, or no, I should say sample quality. It's not data anymore. Ching has already shown you examples. You're going to see more examples. If you have enough training data to capture the, the characteristics of the distribution you're trying to model. Uh, but the sample generation process is, at least a couple years ago, pretty expensive, right? I showed running this, even in 1D, I showed you running this stochastic differential equation, or difference equation, uh, 600 steps. In fact, let me just actually jump back to that a minute. Uh, if I go back to this generation process here, so, that was, so okay, in this case, maybe by 400 steps, things had kind of converged, right? So that's a lot of steps. In 1D, this was pretty fast on my laptop. If you're trying to generate videos, for example, that is a lot of computation. But like anything in engineering and science, if you have a problem that's hard, lots of smart people are going to work on it. All right. So there in the recent literature is a whole host of different methods for trying to accelerate that sample generation process that I'm willing to bet some of the later speakers will describe. And the slides will be available here if you're interested in pursuing or digging into these. So I talked about this in terms of stochastic differential equations. There's also a family of methods that are based on ordinary differential equations where the only randomness is an initial point and then it's deterministic after that. So that's a very hot topic at the moment. And then there's another number of other techniques people have brought in or applied to try to um, make this generation process faster. Maybe I'll just mention one more, which is latent diffusion models where you work in a latent space, a lower dimensional space, instead of in the native space of whatever kinds of things you're trying to generate. Okay, and that's, that's definitely being used. All right, now what I'm going to do is illustrate with that high a level overview a few medical imaging applications, and you'll hear some more today. I'm talking about segmentation, some reconstruction, and so on. There's lots of them that appear in the literature, and I'm just going to show a few of them. All right, so this is one from one of our later speakers in the day, his group, John Trollier at Korea. Maybe you'll see the same slide. It's a recent paper that just came out in IEEE Transactions on Medical Imaging. So here they are applying it to denoising. So certain kinds of MRI images are kind of noisy. Uh, here they've synthetically added noise to make a more noise. So this is what the ground truth is, a not so noisy image. Hope that's showing up okay on these slides. And then they've synthetically added noise to make it, to represent what might happen in some kinds of scans that give you higher noise. And then they computed various estimates for different parameters, various denoising by uh, computing the posterior mean, right? The expected value of P of X given Y. And hopefully you can observe that, uh, that these images look less noisy than the one on the bottom left, the one where they added noise to, and somewhat closer to the ground truth. But at least on my laptop, you can still, there, there's still noise there. No denoising method's gonna eliminate all noise. But what particularly appealed to me about this paper is they also generate uncertainty maps. They did posterior sampling multiple times and then computed point by point the standard deviation of those point posterior samples. And then they're showing pictures of those uncertainty maps and showing how the choice of this particular parameter in their method affects those uncertainty map, uh, maps. And I think whether doctors will ever want to look at uncertainty maps like this, I think, is an open question. But it's definitely useful for to us as developers of these methods to look at these uncertainty method, uncertainty maps, and decide how we want to refine our methods. Think about how much training data, how much, how aggressively we can denoise, and so on. I think this is a real benefit of the generative model family compared to, say, the regularized compressed sensing kind of methods that appeared before generative models took over the field. Uh, here's an application to microscopy image segmentation, where they have microscope images that they would like to identify, stained images they would like to identify nuclei. All right, and in this, the arrows are pointing to one example here where they know from their expertise that this thing in the upper left is actually not a nuclei, but it's showing up in their segmentation. But if they compute the standard deviation of that as a measure of uncertainty, they see bright spots there. So the model is telling you. Well, I think it's a nucleus, but I have a lot of uncertainty in that. And I could imagine in a scientific application like that, knowing that uncertainty could be very valuable. So again, a real benefit of Bayesian models of having those uh, uncertainties in your posterior. I think there's plenty of questions about this. All of the prior models that we're making here may or may not really match the actual data distribution. And so 
putting p-values or confidence intervals on a posterior may be suspect because the priors might be wrong, but at least qualitatively being able to look on, at uncertainty maps I think would have great value in a lot of applications, apparently including this one. Um, here's one from 2020. I don't think this was actually a diffusion model, but some sort of generative Bayesian model where they took th uh, fully sampled MRI data, so this is the, the, the ground truth here, they retrospectively downsampled the case-based data, the raw data that's collected in MRI scanner. If you take that downsampled data and just put it through an adjoint reconstruction, so you just take all the missing data and stick zeros in it and then put it through a standard reconstruction method, you get this, zero, this image here with all these artifacts because of all the data that you're missing. And then they put this through something called the primal enhanced, primal dual enhanced UNET, producing this image on the right. And then they also put it through their generative model-based method, producing these five posterior samples at the bottom. And if you just look at that from a distance, they all look pretty similar. But they put this red box about this region that I hope you can see even from the back of the room, that these different posterior samples are actually remarkably different. I don't know whether it's medically significant. I'm not a knee radiologist. But I see what are definitely visibly, noticeably different you know, image characteristics there. And I think it's great that this method will share that with you. And in fact, if, uh, if I had time, but I think I'm not gonna risk, actually, let me just, let's, let's just do it. <laughs> let's just see if this video happens to work. I'm rolling the dice here. Uh, all right, so can you see this? All right, so what, this is a movie of drawing samples from the posterior for two different acceleration levels. So this is four, this is the original data. This is what's called four times acceleration. I wonder if this will, let's see, yay, okay. This is four times acceleration, which means that you as the patient would be in the scanner four times less long, which would make you happy. This is eight times acceleration, make you even happier, eight times less time in the MRI tube. But look at the incredible variation in this posterior samples if you make the scan eight times faster than it normally would be. Um, that's a lot of variation. Again, I don't know which features of that image are exactly important for diagnosing you know, some injury to the knee. But prior to these generative models, we really didn't have very practical, at least, methods for sampling from the posterior like this to get us, get us a sense of how much uncertainty there is in, uh, in these kind of undersampled reconstructions where we're trying to rely on prior models to make up for missing data. All right. So I've alluded to some risks of generative models already, the possibility of hallucination generating things that aren't there. And this is, or aren't real, or don't really conform to what we think data should look like. And this has even been discussed in the New York Times a few years ago in an article about fake faces. They talked about this example. And they talked about often, let's see, there's only one part of the image. Okay, they're talking about odd artifacts that can appear out of nowhere. Most often, they're only one part of the image, but if you look closely enough, it's hard to unsee it. So if you look at this for a minute, you might see this bit of whatever that is, ear or nose or something that's appeared in this generated face, this is a synthetic face, fake face, and if you're just making faces for a video game, maybe this doesn't matter, but if you're trying to use these kind of methods for diagnosing the presence or absence of tumors in medical imaging, that could be a serious concern, right? So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. Now, generative models actually have a long history in inverse problems in imaging, but the kind of generative models that were used, hmm, 40 years ago were really simple. They're models that just considered relationships between very small groups of neighboring pixels, typically three by three or five by five patches. These came under the names of headings like Markov random field models. And they weren't used for generation though. I mean, technically they're, they're Bayesian methods. Technically you could call them generative models, but they're really used for inference, not really so much for generation. And there's papers that showing there's some perhaps benefits of using such models for doing segmentation. There's also papers from you know, around the same era of actually drawing samples from Markov random fields, leading to generated images that look something like this. And even the abstract of this paper says, these commonly used Markov random fields are not, in fact, capable of representing the moderate to large scale clustering present in natural occurring images, right? So you're only modeling whatever three by three groups of pixels you're not gonna be able to generate a fake face, right? You can generate things that look like clouds. And if you're interested in generation, well, this might be useful for making clouds in the background of a Pixar movie or something, but it's not interesting for making 
you know, more complicated structures for a video game or let alone text or robotic plans or whatever. Um, but in my application, which is medical imaging, especially undersampled MRI, I don't need to generate images. The, the kind of accelerated scans we do in MRI, and you're probably going to hear other examples of this over the course of the day, are examples where we sample the 2D Fourier transform space of the object in a way that we heavily sample the center of what's called K-space, the low spatial frequencies of the images. So if we just do what's called a zero-field inverse reconstruction, something that just kind of focuses on that, that center area, we get like this image, we get the gross details of the image, not the gross details, the gross structure of the image just from that center of the data. What's missing is details. And I'm not sure we need generative models that can generate entire images to fill in details. We might need something more than three by three patches, um, but we don't necessarily need generative models for the entire image. Um, again, in this specific setting of trying to improve, say, accelerated MRI scans. And so I've been working with my group to explore patched-based models, so generative models for patches instead of generative models for entire images. And there's a long history of patch models in the imaging setting using GANs, dictionaries, other things. Uh, and so I think there's an open question we're working on is that could patch-based generative models provide better robustness to distribution shifts, perhaps at the cost of reduced in-distribution performance. Because we're not trying to, the, if I showed you a little patch out of a knee image, it would look a lot like a little patch out of a brain image. Obviously a whole brain and a whole knee look different, right? But little patches might, you might not be able to tell which is which. So we might be able to train in a more universal way on patches and apply that to a broader set of kinds of images. And there are applications, at least in my area, medical imaging, dynamic MRI, where it's basically impossible to get fully sampled training data. So we have very limited, if any, data, and maybe patch models are the best we can do. And so the question is, could we use score models for that? And in the few minutes I have left, I'll give you a little bit about that. So, um, so we're going to start actually going back to Markov random field type formulations, where we write our model for the prior as a product of terms, each of which is an exponential of something that's called a, a clique potential function, so a model for some, not the whole image, but some patch in the image and a product of that over all patches. And this is what comes sometimes called a field of experts or a product of experts. You could think of it a bunch of critics looking at an image, looking at one patch at a time saying, yeah, that patch looks plausible, that patch looks plausible. And another critic says, no, that looks really unlikely. That looks like noise. Doesn't look like anything that has to do with CT images of a patient. And so you're taking the product of the opinions of all those experts. And if any one of the experts says that's really implausible, you're going to get a low value for the probability. That's the idea of this sort of product model, a field of experts, product of experts are closely related. I'm going to further assume a kind of shift in variance here. This is where I'm transitioning, in case you can't tell, from the tutorial to, you know, some, I get a few minutes to talk about research in my group, right? Uh, I'm going to assume that the statistics of patches are sort of independent of where you look. So all the different patches at different locations come from a common patch model just by extracting the patches. And this G sub C is the ma wide matrix that grabs the ceased patch of the image with some common parent clique function, energy function. So if, you, if you're willing to buy that as a plausible model and has a long history in the Markov random field literature, then the log prior that goes with that has got this constant, huh, constant, and then the sum of this potential clique potential function applied to all of the patches. And then if you take the gradient of that with respect to x, the image, that and conveniently again the partition constant goes away and we're left with a relatively simple expression that involves grabbing every patch out of the image, putting it through a patch score function. So if my patches are 5 by 5 then this is something that takes 5 by 5 inputs, produces 5 by 5 outputs and then I have to put those the outputs back in the right place, place in the image, that's what this G transpose does, and add them all up. And now I have a score function for the whole image, but built out of a patchwise model that will have far fewer parameters because it's much lower dimensional model. And then I can take patches from training images. Even if I have just a couple training images, there's a lot of patches. So T here could be large because every image has a lot of patches in it, and apply denoising score matching or whatever the latest techniques that you'll hear about later in the day to learn the parameters of my score follow model, uh, patch score model. And now finally I can put those pieces together to, to do all the things I've been talking about, the Bayesian inference sampling and so on. 
And I have, I assume you want to leave some, where's Ching, where did Ching go? How much time do you want me to leave for questions, Ching? <laughs> yeah, so that's why I didn't know. You scheduled me till 10, the next speaker at 10. Do you want me to leave any time for questions? <laughs> Five minutes, okay, great. I will leave five minutes for questions according to the organizers. All right, um, so this is some work that Jason has done with me where we've taken a whole bunch of images that I call pizza phantoms, random images that look roughly like this, disks of various intensities, grabbed patches from those, and then developed a patch score model that happens to be a multi-layer perceptron that takes, we're actually starting simple with just three by three patches. So it takes three by three in, goes through multi-layer perceptron with these widths and ends up with nine three by three outputs. We have various um, non-linearities. I have no idea, graduate student descent maybe, why this combination of non-linearities was used. <laughs> All right. And so and then we added noise to different training ex images from similar distributions, producing noisy images like this. And then we've denoised those images with both off-the-shelf methods, like what's called block matching 3D, which will mean something to some people in the audience, total variation, and then denoising using the score matching. And even just using three by three patches, in this very anecdotal preliminary example, we get a higher PSNR with score matching than with, say, using total variation. And this is somewhat intuitive, because total variation only looks at neighboring pixels. You could think of it as you, it's a model for two by one and one by two patches. That's very limited scope, right? Whereas here we're using three by three. That's a lot more pixels already, all right? Uh, in and of course, the receptive field of all the networks you're gonna hear about later in the day are much bigger than three by three, I promise you. And the way we're doing this denoising is by just doing gradient descent of the log posterior, basically like I showed you earlier, except the score term now uses patch score model instead of a whole image score model. All right, I wouldn't draw any solid conclusions from this, but it's just you know, preliminary results suggesting that for some applications, maybe patching might, modeling based on patches might work fine. And now something we worry all the time about in, in machine learning is what happens if dif distribution shifts. So here's the same images I just showed you. Denoise images, denoise with total variation, then denoise with score matching. Exactly the same, just to put on the top row. On the bottom row, I changed something, something very small. <laughs> and here's a noisy image. Total variation still worked very well, exactly the same PSNR. And now suddenly my score matching method worked terribly. If this was I might ask you what changed, but I'll just tell you that if you look at the scale here, I don't know if you can see, all I did is multiply this image by two. And my patch score model was designed for images that are sort of on a zero run range. And when I apply it, just took the image and scaled by a factor of two, it worked a lot less well, all right? And so that's a very simple form of distribution shift that this particular model that I learned is not robust to. Now, there are simple ways to normalize images that would, could deal with this particular distribution shift, but it's something to think about more generally. There's lots of forms of distribution shifts that can happen between test data, training data and test data. And I think the field is still evolving to how to work on that in all aspects, including in score-based diffusion models. I'm gonna skip this. Here's another form of distribution shift where my image now has rectangles in it instead of circles. All right, and I was pleasantly surprised that denoising with a score model that was learned three by three patches from an image full of disks works still better than total variation with a scale on the, on the right scale here. Um, training, and in fact, in this particular case, it worked better than, than when uh, I actually trained it. Oh, sorry, sorry, I've said that wrong. Training with circles and testing with squares worked better than total variation, which is reassuring. Training with rectangles still worked even better, right? So. Again, there's a desire to have training data that matches your testing data, but this worked maybe better than I would have hoped. Although, if you look closely, here's a square in the original image that kind of came out like a circle <laughs> in the test data. Now, of course, it, it doesn't really know it's a circle. It's working with three by three patches. So at a three by three patch level, it's very hard to tell whether something's a circle square, but you know, distribution shifts are a concern in this field. I'm gonna skip this, uh, I think I'm gonna skip this. And so to summarize, I hope I've convinced you that, okay, generative models are useful in lots of fields, including medical imaging. Uh, I hope it give you a little taste that possibly, if in some applications, we don't need generative models for entire images, maybe generative models just for patches would suffice. 
with concerns about generalizability and distribution shifts for all these models. Uh, we'll, in our future work, we're going to do more comparison with whole, Im whole image models. Uh, and when we get to dynamic, ultimately my, my goal here is dynamic imaging, 3D plus time. I don't even know how we'd ever possibly train a whole image model for something that's four dimensional like that. All of the 1D examples that I showed here today are in a Julia repo that you could play with yourself if you're interested. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. And I left five minutes for questions and two minutes for the next speaker to set up. Okay, uh, good question, actually. Uh, going back, a more fundamental question. Going back to your, uh, when you introduced the sigma. Uh, uh, the sigma. So yeah. there's lots of sigmas here. Do you mean I know for the, the first one, the very first one, the which is the one. Oops. The kernel density estimate, or yeah. okay, all right. Uh, let me find that right there. Okay. Yes. So, so thinking as a Bayesian statistician, yes. this is my hyperparameter. Yeah, I, yeah. Bias. I guess sigma is a hyperparameter. I agree with that. Yes. That means that in your next, then going forward, just want to try to understand going forward when you would say, well, we can consider a uh, various values for sigma, imagine what you're doing there ah. is introducing a hyper distribution on that, right? I mean, like, yes, doing that's a hierarchical absolutely right. base approach, right? That, that's absolutely right. That's, and in the, that's the, what's going on. Um, I, yes, I agree with that statement. Yes. Okay. So there's some distribution. So there's an expectation over the distributions of sigma that's used here. And I actually don't know whether the field has settled on what's the right distribution of that. Uh, maybe one of the other expert speakers of the day can tell me. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, still, um, the reason it doesn't shouldn't matter too much is because at the end of the day, data should come into play, and the sample themselves are from the posterior, right? I just want to understand. Ab that's correct. That's right. So now the second question that I have, it's, I must say again, thinking as a computer scientist, there seems to be something a little magical here. <laughs> okay. Right? Computationally, because we know that sampling from the posterior is usually a very hard thing to do. Ah, <laughs> so yes. So there must okay. be some something, either you're exploiting something, some special property, or the worst case, it's, it's unlikely to generate. Well, uh, so okay, so. Can you talk about that? Right, so I, I'm sure other speakers will say more about that, but the magic really is in this, the mathematics that underlies these stochastic differential equations. Well, or the ordinary differential equations you'll probably hear more about later today. And so I agree, it is kind of magical. It's a little mysterious to me. But there are mathematical proofs that show this actually does lead to samples from the distribution. Probably in the limit, I mean, this is written here as a, as a differential equation, and you have to discretize it. And I'm sure there's conditions on you know, the, the discretization and so on. I don't know the details of that. So, but uh, it is kind of well, no, fascinating. Well, I mean. that. I, it's, it's from our perspective, I, I agree that it will eventually be from the posterior. Okay. Not, uh -huh. I don't have any issues with that. Oh, okay. My issue is how fast and is oh, it any yeah. faster than the previous approaches. Ah, okay. Excellent question, right. So, um, and now we'd have to get down to the details of previous approaches. Like in the Markov random field literature, a lot of the previous approaches kind of involve sweeping over the image and updating a few pixels at a time, and that's really expensive. This approach is updating the entire image at a time, right? This, this, this recurrence equation, or however you want to describe it. So I think there's one benefit from that. But I think we would have to sit down and look at what you consider the state-of-the-art previous approach for sample, sampling from priors and compare. Go ahead, Ulek. Yep. i still got two minutes left. Yep. All right. Uh, mine is um, maybe quick, maybe okay. not. So All my right. question was uh, related to patch-based models, which mm -hmm. I found very interesting. And uh, there's a statement you made that they might potentially be more robust. And I just wanted to hear what's kind of, why do you think they might be more robust? Is there indication for it? Uh, so I don't have data to support that yet, but just my conjecture is that little patches out of images, like MRI knees versus MRI brains, look really similar. It's the whole, the gross structure is very different, right? But at patch level, you know, a lot of patches are just sort of like a little step function at some angle, right? And so that, that's my intuition. It might be wrong, right? I wouldn't make that claim for things with textures, right? Images full of textures might have really different properties, even at the patch level, right? So, so I don't. Let me back that claim to in certain settings. <laughs> Thank you. All right, one more, and then I think I should let the next speaker. So. Um, my question is, um, how does score matching can be used for uh, non-smooth 
density function ah, and you take the can yeah that's a great degree. question the question is how can you apply score matching to non-smooth density functions well um, I don't know the theory about that. In practice, what happens is as soon as we start adding noise, so in the denoising score matching case, right, we're adding noise to the data. So even if you start with a, uh, a non-smooth uh, distribution, then it'll immediately become smooth, right? Because you're taking the distribution and convolving it with a Gaussian, right? Adding Gaussian noise is equivalent in the PDF name of convolution with the Gaussian function. Now, so that, that's the intuition that goes with that, but of course, when you draw a sample, uh, when you do this, this sigma distribution here isn't probably going to go all the way to zero. It's going to start at some sigma min and some sigma max. There'll be some range. And so you'll never generate samples exactly from the original distribution, I think, that has, that's non-smooth. You'll generate samples from some slightly smooth or maybe more than slightly smooth version of it. And if other experts disagree, we, we can discuss that in the late afternoon. So I, I yeah. Um, and in fact, the total variation distribution, that mathematical model, it's non-smooth, right? It has a ridge at the top. Um, so I, I kind of, yeah, I'd be interested to hear from you later whether you think there are real world applications that really have non-smooth distributions. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everybody. I'd be happy to discuss with you more later in the day. Thank you.